Hello, bonjour, mes amis, bienvenue, welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. The show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about the character uh, that we've created, and we try to make a character that is um, both powerful and also very fun to play in-game. So um, if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the game, or even more maybe for some of you, um, then welcome home. This is where you belong. I hope that you are happy to be here because I am happy to have you. My name's Colby and uh, I'll be your host. Really quick, before we jump into the episode this week, just a quick reminder, uh, if you are inclined to try and support this channel other than viewing and liking and subscribing, which I thank you for, but you want to maybe go a step further, um, you can join uh, as a member. There's a little, should be a little link down there somewhere. And for just a couple bucks a month, um, you do get a little cheat sheet write-up guide that I post to um, the community for all um, for all members of the channel each week. Um, it's just a little way for me to kind of say thank you and give you something. Um, really, mostly uh, being a member of the channel is just a way for you to support me and us and help us create more content and better content. And so thank you so much for those uh, who are members. Really appreciate you and appreciate having all of you, regardless of whether you are a member of the channel or not. Thanks for being here. Um, Today, the build that I've created for the week is motivated by and founded upon um, one simple principle, and it is this. Getting a critical hit in D&D is a lot of fun. Um, everybody cheers, high fives are given, snacks are thrown up in the air, dogs are barking. Um, ultimately, we play this game, I think, uh, most of us anyway, I hope, uh, to have fun. And so I wanted to build a character that looks for ways to make that awesome moment of getting a critical hit, right? More frequent and um, celebration worthy. Uh, I want to find ways to make that crit as powerful as possible, right? In other words, I want to build a crit fisher. What's a crit fisher? This is a term that you hear bandied about on uh, you know, the D&D forums and the tubes. Um, and generally speaking, you know, it, it, when people talk about a crit fishing or a crit fisher, they're talking about a character that both tries to get a lot of critical hits um, and also hit extra hard when they do land those critical hits. It can be a pretty fun and powerful way to create a character. And I've actually never done one before in the almost year that I've been doing this uh, YouTube channel now. I can't believe it's almost been a year. Next month, we're coming up on our anniversary. Anyway, never done one, at least intentionally, not in the way that I'm, that I'm doing it today. So what are the things to keep in mind when you are trying to build a, a crit fisher type character, right? Um, I, again, I think primarily we need two things. One, we need ways to get our chance to get a critical hit as high as possible. And there's a few ways to do that, which we'll get into. And two, we want ways to do extra damage when we do land that critical hit. Uh, we will be focusing on both of those things with the build uh, today. And because of that, I almost see this character and this concept as kind of akin to like the Magic Touch Sorcerer uh, build that I did a few months ago now, uh, or maybe the Thornlock episode for those who have caught either of those. That was a few weeks ago. The, the Crit Fisher, of course, is a concept a little more common, a little more frequently seen in D&D than those two weird things that I that I made that I had a lot of fun with. Um, but still, we're, we're, we're trying to build around a concept, a theme, a mechanic, right? Almost restraining ourselves unnecessarily, perhaps, in the name of being true to this theme or mechanic. Uh, and from there, we want to sort of see how far we can push it, right? numbers-wise, and uh, and get to a point where we can at least hopefully be competitive uh, with like our damage per round or whatever whatever metric we're you know quantifying. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I think about this crit fisher, sort of a, a almost almost restraining myself intentionally with sort of a, a very laser focus on getting my crit chance as high as possible, getting my crit damage as high as possible, even if it means it might not necessarily you know, be the best 
uh, option for doing the most damage that a character could possibly do, right? We're sort of saying first priority, you know, crit, crit chance and crit damage, everything else comes secondary to that, right? And then can we, working within those restraints, sort of really make a character that's still very competitive damage-wise? Um, spoiler alert, yes we can. <laughs> Even though um, we are fishing for big, almost Nova-esque uh, critical hits with this build, I'm not going to consider it to be like a Nova or a burst damage build. And here's why. I think for Nova damage builds, the, the burst damage that you do has to be something that you can like trigger on demand, right? Um, you expend a bunch of resources, whether spells or whatever, and you just unload everything you've got on the enemy when you want to, typically at the beginning of a fight, so as to try and eliminate you know, one or even maybe multiple enemies right off the bat to kind of tip the scales of the fight in your favor, right? That's sort of how burst or nova damage builds typically work, I think. And with this character, it doesn't really work that way, right? Uh, when, when the character gets a critical hit, they are going to do a lot of, you know, burst-like damage, but it's not up to you when you get a crit with, with this build. Anyway, um, it's up to the dice, right? So I feel more comfortable averaging everything out, trying to get our crit chance as high as possible while adding a lot of dam extra damage when we do get a critical hit, but ultimately we're at the mercy of the dice for our burst damage. And so it feels more like a sustained DPR damage. You have to just sort of say, okay, you know, when we add in that extra critical hit chance and the critical hit damage, you know, what does that do to our overall numbers on average? How frequently are we going to be getting those? You know, what does our sustained uh, damage per round DPR look like, you know, when we really try and bump those critical hit numbers, right? And so we're going to treat it like a sustained DPR build. We're going to compare it to other sustained DPR builds that I've done. And for those who don't know, I, I do keep a spreadsheet. If you look in the video description, you'll see uh, graphs in the spreadsheet for this build, and then also a comparison of this build to other, um, you know, sustained damage per round builds that I've done thus far. So you can kind of see where they fall, how they compare uh, to one another. So that's the preamble. Without any further ado, I present episode 48, The Crit Fisher. Let's jump in. All right, I level one. For our class, we are going to start off this character's career as a barbarian. Um, you know, this is going to be a character who swings for the fences, as it were. Um, they throw caution to the wind and they just try to hit as hard as they can, uh, potentially putting themselves in greater danger by doing so, and nobody really encapsulates that concept, I think, quite like the barbarian does. For your race, I would suggest taking the half-orc. Um, it's my first half-orc. How exciting. Uh, right, so if we're looking for every way possible to add damage on a critical hit, it's hard to go any other route here for race anyway if we're doing melee damage, which we are, because, among other things, half-orcs get the savage attack, uh, savage attacks feature, which tells us that when we score a critical hit, with a melee weapon attack, importantly, we can roll one of the weapon's damage die uh, one additional time. And is there anything more quintessential than a half-orc barbarian in D&D? I submit that there is not. Um, so, as for our ability scores, assuming point by, as always, and assuming that we get to use Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, as always, to put the bonuses where we want, um, I would suggest going Strength 15, and then taking your plus two there, Constitution 15, and taking your plus one there. And actually, now that I think about that, isn't that the default for half works anyway? <laughs> Maybe the first time since Tasha's came out that uh, I went with the default racial bonuses, if so. A 12 dexterity and a 13 charisma. Um, the question here is going to be, do you want one less on your constitution modifier? Uh, or your dex modifier, right? We could get a 14 constitution and a 14 dex total if we wanted to. Um, personally, I think I would rather start the game with a 16 constitution and a 12 dex than a 14 in each. Here's why. Um, eventually, we're going to be using reckless attacks, right? Uh, meaning that enemies will have advantage on attacks against us. And bumping our AC by one more uh, by putting another point into dexterity is nice, but 
Our AC is never going to be amazing with this character because we can't wear heavy armor as a barbarian and benefit from our rage fully. Um, and we're not going to be using a shield, we're going to be using a two-handed weapon, so you know, when enemies have advantage against us, they're probably going to hit us most of the time anyway, I mean, especially at higher levels, I guess. Um, so taking one more in, one more, you know, getting one more bump to our armor class uh, seems less valuable, frankly, than getting one more hit point every level because since we're raging and we get, we'll be getting resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be resistant to most of the damage that will that the character will take throughout their career. So one hit point is closer to like two hit points for us. So I just think I just think the hit points are more valuable if you really want to do a 14 in each, especially because you know you want a better initiative score and you know maybe even stealth or whatever uh, dexterity saving throws, etc. Go for it. Um, I'd do 16 and 12. As for equipment, um, I would recommend doing the gold buy option here because um, we really want a couple of different weapons. We want a battle axe and we want a pike. And uh, by default, if you just take standard equipment, uh, barbarians only get one martial weapon and those are both martial weapons. So the pike is actually going to be the go-to weapon for this character once we hit level four. Um, so for all of you pike lovers out there who keep complaining to me that I never talk about the pike or use it uh, in, in my builds, this is for you. There's got to be at least three of you, or four, maybe. Why battle axe? At level one we'd be using a battle axe. Why, why a d12 weapon uh, as opposed to, like, say, a greatsword, which is a 2d6? The 2d6 should do more damage, slightly more damage on average, right? Um, normally, yes, but I think in our case, thanks to the half-orc savage attacks, if we crit with a 2d6 weapon, we'd only get to roll an extra d6, rules as written, uh, because it says one of the weapon's damage dice. Your DM may rule differently and let you roll 2d6 more when you get a critical hit, um, but otherwise, when you get that critical hit, rolling an extra d12 will be really nice. And I mean, as a half-orc, don't we like have to use a great axe, right? I think it's written into the code of the half-orcs or something somewhere. We're crit fisher, we want to max our crits as much as we can. One note, barbarians uh, only get 2d4 times 10 gold to start if you take the gold buy option. That's not a lot. You could, if you roll really poorly, you could be in trouble here. Um, if you roll well, you could potentially afford scale mail armor and a battle axe, in which case I would say do that. Um, and then pick up a pike later, they're pretty cheap. Uh, you just need to get one by the time you're level four. If you don't roll well, we just gotta go naked. We're a barbarian, so it's not that bad, but there it is. If you're super concerned about your level one squishiness, uh, start with a level one fighter and then go barbarian, but then you're delaying your extra attacks and things, so uh, anyway. Just stay alive. Barbarians at level one also get the rage feature, quintessential barbarian feature. We know it, we love it. Um, as a bonus action, you enter rage, um, you can't be wearing heavy armor, and then you have advantage on your strength checks and your strength saving throws. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which again is most of the damage that most monsters do in the game at most tables, right? Your experience may differ. When you make a melee weapon attack using strength, you get an extra plus two to the damage that you deal if you hit. Um, that does scale with more levels in Barbarian. Um, you can't cast spells while you're raging, you can't concentrate on spells while you're raging. It lasts one minute or until you go for a full round without making an attack or taking damage. So make sure you keep like some javelins with you so you can still make an attack if somebody's not in melee range. And you can do this two times per long rest for now. Then also at level one, we get unarmored defense. It makes not having armor hurt a little less. Uh, so if we're not wearing armor, our, our armor class is now our constitution modifier plus our dexterity modifier. Still not great for us. That puts us at a 14 armor class. Um, but scale mail would have only put us at a 16 for now. So it's not the end of the world, it's a difference of two. Still, you know, grab some scale mail uh, as soon as you can, or maybe even borrow some gold from a friend if you didn't quite roll high enough to, to be able to afford the scale mail. Um, but anyway, stay alive. At level two, we get reckless attacks. Um, this plus rage is what makes barbarians so good at early level. So when you make your first attack on your turn, you can decide to attack recklessly 
giving you advantage on all of your melee weapon attacks using strength this turn at the cost of giving your enemies advantage against you until your next turn. Um, with, with resistance to uh, most damage that you're going to be taking, especially early on, and a low-ish armor class to boot that enemies are probably going to hit anyway, you should probably be recklessly attacking almost always, right? When I crunch the numbers, I, I always assume that we are. Advantage is so good, and it's so important for this character concept especially, um, when you get bonuses to critical hits like we do. A normal character without advantage just has a 5% chance to get a critical hit. With advantage, it almost doubles, going up to 9.75% chance to get a critical hit. And, um, of course, your chance to hit goes way up as well, so it's very good, very strong. Also, at level 2, we get Danger Sense, which just gives us advantage on dexterity saving throws against things that you can see, like spells or traps, etc. Super nice, great for our survivability. At level 3, we get 3 rages per long rest now. Um, should That should get most of us through an entire day's worth of combat on most days, based on the feedback you guys have given me, uh, on the number of combats you typically have at your table, and my own anecdotal evidence. So that's really nice. And then we get our Primal Path, our subclass, and we are going to take the Berserker. What? No! Oh, so bad! <laughs> Sorry, I just went into kind of a frenzied rage there for a second. I know, I know. Calm down, and let me explain. Here's what we read about the Berserker Barbarian. For some barbarians, rage is a means to an end. That end being violence. <clears throat> the path of the Berserker is a path of untrammeled fury, slick with blood. As you enter the Berserker's rage, you thrill in the chaos of battle, heedless of your own health or well-being. So. There are two reasons why I want to go Berserker here. First off, for story and for fun. Um, nowhere does the Berserker fit better, in my opinion, than on a Crit Fisher build. This character is always swinging for the fences, right? They aren't careful, they aren't conservative, they throw caution to the wind, they're trying to hit a home run every single time, and the Berserker perfectly encapsulates this, I think. Second off, I have always wanted, always wanted to create a Berserker, but the problem is, it usually just doesn't make a lot of sense to do so, numbers-wise. But I think this build provides a bit of an exception to that rule, so let me explain. As a Berserker Barbarian, at level 3, we get the Frenzy ability, right? And this is the thing that, that makes a Berserker a Berserker. So we are told that we can go into a Frenzy when we rage. When we do so, we can make a single melee weapon attack as a bonus action on every attack after this one, um, because because we used our bonus action to rage, right? That is amazing, an ec a full extra attack, right, as a bonus action. But there is one big, big downside to it, and it is this, when your rage ends, you suffer one level of exhaustion. That's bad. Like. That's really pretty bad. For those who don't know, because exhaustion I don't think actually comes up at most tables all that often, um, I could be wrong, but there are six levels of exhaustion, right? When you suffer one level, you receive a penalty to how your character functions until that level of exhaustion is removed, and, and they will stack, increasing the sort of penalties that you get, right, as you get more levels of exhaustion. There aren't a lot of ways to reduce or to remove exhaustion. If you take a long rest and eat and drink, uh, you can remove one level of it. That's great. The, the Greater Restoration spell, which is a fifth level spell, mind you, uh, can remove one level of it. And, you know, you have to spend 100 gold in material components to cast that spell as well. You know, if you die and you're resurrected, you, will, you can remove one level of exhaustion, right? But it's not really easy uh, to get rid of. Now, one level of exhaustion is not that bad, in my opinion. Um, it gives you disadvantage on all of your ability checks. Okay, I can live with that. It's not great, but it's bearable. Two levels, it, your speed is halved. That's, uh, that hurts, but most fights you could suffer through, I think. Beyond that, it gets very bad very quickly. Um, at three levels, you have disadvantage on all of your attacks and your saves. 
uh, just totally decimating our damage and our survivability. At, level, at four levels of exhaustion, your hit points are halved. Uh, at five, you can't move, and at six, you die. <laughs> so realistically, if we went Berserker Barbarian, we wouldn't want to frenzy more than once per day most of the time, I think. You pick what you think is the most important fight of the day, you frenzy, and you get an extra attack every single turn at the cost of having disadvantage on your ability checks until you take a long rest and eat, right? Again, for this character, I love the high-risk, high-reward approach. Now, the main reason, I think, that people really don't go this route and say that it's bad, that it's a bad subclass, and as many of you are probably thinking right now and perhaps even typing in the comments, is because most people who want to optimize their barbarian, at least especially, will typically take like the polearm master feat or find some other way to get a good weaponized bonus action attack, right? And so the benefit from that third attack is very minimal um, when compared to the huge downside of suffering exhaustion. We, however, are not going to take the polearm master feat um, for a very good reason, which I'll explain in a minute. And so I think this is the perfect opportunity for me to finally create the Berserker that I have always dreamed of. Um, of course, you don't have to do this, right? The reality is, assuming that you only frenzy once per day, that one combat encounter would be amazing, and then the rest of the day would be fairly subpar for your damage when compared to, say, for example, the Zealot Barbarian, who actually would fit pretty well thematically with this character, as you'll see later. The Zealot would do worse damage than the Frenzied Barbarian, uh, Berserker, um, in that one, you know, that one combat encounter, but then a little more otherwise on, you know, subsequent, uh, subsequent encounters. So, if you want to be a wuss, sorry, I mean, if you want to have more reliable sustained damage numbers, um, go with the Zealot or something else, of course, if you'd rather. But for me, again, I just, I really love the idea of like saving that frenzied rage for that really difficult, really important fight once per day and just unleashing this rabid, frenzied, uh, raging half-orc barbarian that's straight up devastating for one glorious combat encounter. And, and maybe two, right? Maybe if you know it's the end of the day and this is a big fight and it's really important, maybe you might be able to get a couple of days rest after. I mean, it's hard to know, right, in D&D. But, you know, if you really want to play it risky or maybe not frenzy on the, on the next day so you can, you know, get that exhaustion down or whatever, you could do it a couple of times a day in a really tight pinch. But anyway, I love the high risk, high reward play style. And this really augments that aspect for us. Okay, at level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and we are going to take the piercer feat. Um, this is the point at which I think we really kind of start to feel like a crit fisher. Piercer is new to Tasha's. Can I stop saying that now? I feel like Tasha's has been out for like eight months, right? I can stop saying that. It typically doesn't really add a lot of damage for most builds, but for us, we love this feat. So first off, we get a plus one to our strength or dexterity. Um, so now we're at an 18 strength, super awesome. Um, second off, once per turn, when you hit with a piercing attack, you can reroll one of the attack's damage dice and must use the new roll. Super awesome. Actually, this is pretty crap, but it's better with a high damage weapon than with a low one. So anyway, we'll take it. Um, third off, uh, and most importantly for us, when you score a critical hit that deals piercing damage, you can roll one additional damage die. So now it's time for us to switch to the pike. This is my first time using the pike. The pike is kind of a frustrating weapon, and so I think there's good reason why I haven't used it thus far. As far as I know, it's the only melee weapon in game that is both heavy and does piercing damage. Um, correct me if I'm wrong there, I'm sure you will, but uh, I'll talk about why heavy is important later. But that's the main reason why we're using a pike now instead of a lance, which is a d12, but that also has reach and does piercing damage, but it's not considered heavy, oddly. And also, the, the other reason we wouldn't go lance here is because with a lance, you actually have 
disadvantage to hit an enemy if they're within five feet of you. So reach is nice, but if they get up close to you, like you either got to move away and take an opportunity attack and then attack. And so it's just, it's weird. It's kind of really meant to be used uh, on a mount, I think. You could do it if you're confident that, you know, you're not going to have a trouble keeping enemies at bay, but it, it was just a little too awkward. So I'm taking the D10 pike as opposed to the D12 lance here. The D10 pike is heavy, so eventually we'd, we'd switch to it regardless. The frustrating thing about the pike is that you can't use it to benefit from the polearm master bonus action attack, right? If we took the polearm master feat, we could get the, you get to make an opportunity attack when an enemy enters your reach bit from that feat, but not the, you can use your bonus action to attack with the opposite end of the weapon, right? Th that bit, the, the butt action bit, which is really the best bit. The spear can, the halberd can, uh, it, it, isn't a pike just basically a spear, but like as long as a halberd? Maybe not. I read somewhere that pikes were like nine feet long. So anyway, a tweet from Jeremy Crawford says they considered the pike too unwieldy to include in the butt action bit of the of the polearm master feet. So the poor pike just kind of gets the shaft, no pun intended, uh, for reach weapons. But that's okay. We are not here to just take the default polearm master great weapon master feet like every other melee user in the world does, right? We are here to stick to our crit fisher concept and so we're going to figure out a way to make this awesome regardless. And again, this gives me the perfect excuse to go berserker here. So I'm actually kind of grateful for the weirdness of the pike. We are embracing the challenge. We are embracing the frenzy. At level five, we get extra attack. Um, thank you very much. So now when we take the attack action on our turn, we can attack twice instead of once. Hooray. At level six, we're gonna make a change here. So at this point, our frenzied barbarian has, for some reason, decided to strive to take their ferocity and channel it a little bit, to focus it somewhat, to add discipline, to add training to their previously unchecked savagery, um, and to become thus an even more effective fighting machine. Perhaps a party member is rubbing off on you. Perhaps you are impressed by an enemy or an NPC ally. Um, perhaps you lost control during one of your frenzies and you hurt someone that you care about and you now seek to sort of exert control over that beast within almost. Whatever the reason, we're going to take some fighter levels now. So as a fighter level one, you get second wind, which is a nice little self heal uh, once per short rest. As a bonus action, you can heal yourself for 1d10 plus your fighter levels. Uh, that's that's nice, especially early on, and especially for us who you know our hit points are maybe more valuable than they are for other characters. And then we get to choose a fighting style. I'm gonna recommend. It, it's a soft recommendation. A great weapon fighting style. Um, when you make an attack with a melee weapon that you use two hands uh, with, you can re-roll ones and twos, and you must use the new roll. Um, the truth is, the great weapon fighting style isn't amazing. It doesn't add a ton of damage, especially since we already have the piercer feat that lets us re-roll once per turn, you know, one of the damage dice that we do on, a, on an attack that does piercing damage. So it might even be less desirable than it otherwise would be. Unless you can convince your dungeon master that these two features, the great weapon fighting style and the piercer feet, you could use them on the same roll, right? We discussed this in one of my sliding into my DMs episodes um, a while back. The consensus seems to be that, that the two don't stack, right? That you could use one or the other, but not both. The piercer feet, you could reroll any number, a three or four or five, even if you wanted to. The great weapon fighting style is ones and twos only, but both of them say, um, you know, when you re-roll, you must use the new roll. So, your DM may feel differently. If so, congratulations. Again, this fighting style is really only about one more damage per attack on average, so it's not huge. Um, justifiably, you might want to take, you know, superior technique for a single battle master maneuver per short rest, or even defense fighting style or something else, but in the name of trying to push our DPR uh, as much as we can, we'll go this route. And you know, it will feel really nice when you get a crit and you roll three D10s 
and you turn a like a one, two, and a three into a seven, eight, and a nine or something, right? But again, feel free to take a different option here if you want to. So let's do a damage report for level six. It's pretty straightforward, our technique here. Um, I'm gonna crunch the numbers assuming that we are using Frenzy. And yes, I know it's not particularly sustainable, and I said this was a sustained damage per round build. But as I discussed at length last week in the Sorlock Cheese Grater build, I might be out of cards already, but if I'm not, um, there's a link there. For our purposes, for my purposes, sustainable DPR means damage that you can do for at least one entire combat encounter. So under those rules, this qualifies. Obviously, outside of that frenzied combat encounter, um, your damage is going to go down. Uh, we will get a way to help combat that in a couple of levels here. Um, but for now, anyway, I'm assuming three attacks with your D10 pike uh, with a plus seven to hit, thanks to our 18 strength and three proficiency bonus, uh, plus six to damage, thanks to our strength bonus and uh, rage damage. And then when you crit, you get to roll not two D10s, but four D10s, thanks to our half-orc savage attacks and uh, the piercer feed. And by the way, there is a 27% chance right now that at least one of our attacks will crit per turn. So it's pretty good. We want to get it better. But for now, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you will do on average 42 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it will be 38 damage per round. Um, not bad at all. In fact, it's it's near the top of the charts for this level when compared to other sustained damage per round uh, characters that I've created, again, with the uh, understanding that it will go down uh, when you don't have frenzy, when you don't want to give yourself another level of exhaustion, I should say. At level 7, we are a fighter 2, and we get action surge. Once per short rest, you get to an entire action, extra action to do with as you please. So at this point, we're making two attacks per turn when we take the attack action, and when we action surge, we get four attacks. And if we are, you know, frenzying, it would be five attacks, because again, that extra attack that we're getting from frenzy is a part of our bonus action, right? So we, we're not making three attacks as our action, right? So it would be two, action surge, two more, frenzied bonus action for a fifth. One of the best, if not the best, burst damage abilities in the game, right? Pretty straightforward. At level eight, we're a fighter three, and we get to choose our subclass, our martial archetype. And we are going <laughs> champion. Oh, that most boring and vanilla of fighter archetypes, the champion. You know what? This is my first ever champion. It's just a day of firsts, isn't it? Uh, the, the, okay, here's, here's our description. The archetypal champion focuses on the development of raw physical power, honed to deadly perfection. Those who model themselves on this archetype combine rigorous training with physical excellence to deal devastating blows. It sounds like a very fitting description of the character that we are trying to create. We're really only here for one reason, and that is the improved critical feature that champions get at level three. So our weapon attacks crit on a 19 or a 20 now instead of just a 20. Honestly, if you are building a character whose entire purpose in life is to crit as frequently and as hard as possible, it's hard to imagine going any other route, frankly. The champion, it doesn't get enough love. Uh, sure, it's a little bland. But this will take our already very good critical hit chance of 9.75% all the way up to an amazing 19% chance to crit on every single attack. For those of us who love reliable good numbers like moi, uh, this is anything but bland. Yes, Hexblade Warlocks can do this as well. They can crit on a 19 um, on their Hexblade Cursed target, but they only get to do that on one enemy once per short rest, right? This is just always on, all the time, forever. And we are going to get a lot of mileage out of it. At level 9, we are a Fighter 4, and we get an ability score increase or feat. Um, I felt like I had to take one more level in Fighter here, even though... There are other places to go and classes to see. But I've delayed Great Weapon Master uh, for too long, and it's just such an amazing feat for our damage. Um, and yes, this is why we wanted to use a heavy weapon uh, in the pike. No, it doesn't actually benefit us, benefit us when we crit uh, any more than when we hit normally. 
because now if we use a heavy weapon, we can do an extra 10 flat damage on a hit. Um, and we don't get to double that flat damage, right, when we get a critical hit. Um, but still, 10 flat damage is just a lot of damage to add to every single attack. It's almost like having another 2d10, almost. Now, of course, it comes at the cost of a minus five to hit. And that hurts, but because we have advantage, it hurts a lot less for us than it would for, for other characters. What's also amazing, though, about this feat um, that, that, that really encouraged me to take it beyond just the damage increase of that 10 flat damage is, is the part that I usually actually just gloss over when I talk about this feat. If we crit with the Great Weapon Master feat, if we crit or reduce an enemy to zero hit points with our melee weapon, we can make a bonus action attack with a melee weapon. Normally, with these heavy weapon using martial builds, uh, we have a good use of our bonus action, especially if we took the polearm master feet, right? And so this is just a very minor bump to our damage. But for us, sitting on a 19% chance to crit, and as a character who's probably often, you know, killing other characters or reducing them to zero hit points, it means that this is actually a pretty nice bump to our sustained damage per round when we're not frenzied, right? On those, on those encounters where we don't have frenzy, still every time we crit or reduce an enemy to zero hit points, we'll still get that bonus action attack. And we have a 34% chance that at least one attack each turn will crit. So that means, you know, every three rounds or so, on average, we should be getting that bonus action attack off anyway. Um, this makes me feel a lot less bad about going Berserker. So damage report for level 9. Um, tactics here have not changed much, obviously, but our crit rate has gone way up. In fact, when you're frenzied, your chance of getting a critical hit at least once per turn is almost 50%. <laughs> That's amazing. And of course, we've added a ton of damage via the Great Weapon Master feat. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, on average, we will be doing 72 damage per round during our frenzy round anyway. A um, little bit less, otherwise not as bad as it used to be. Um, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, we will be doing 54 damage per round on average. That's still in the upper half of like tier one for sustained uh, damage per round builds. And that's great. Let's see if we can keep it going. Also, one thing to keep in mind, now that we're level nine, several classes will actually have access to the Greater Restoration spell. It might be asking a lot to see if they can wipe a level of exhaustion for you using a fifth level spell and 100 gold in material components. I, I get that, but maybe if you're really nice to them? All right, at level 10. It turns out that our Berserker Barbarian, who's been working on focusing their rage, has found religion. It's possible that the one who's been training you uh, to discipline yourself, right, uh, and embrace a more formal training is a paladin themselves, or at the very least is maybe strongly, strongly religious. And the more structured our barbarian gets the more strict they get with themselves, the more interested and influenced they become by the deity that drives their trainer, maybe. Whatever the reason may be for you, we are taking some paladin levels here. I think um, an important part of any Crit Fisher build, as I mentioned at the beginning, is to have some nice ability or abilities to add even more damage on demand when they land a critical hit. And for a melee weapon user, there's really no better way to do that, I think, than via some Paladin levels. So, as a Paladin, level one, we get um, Divine Sense twice per day for us. It's one plus your Charisma modifier, and we only have a 13 Charisma, right? Uh, as an action, you can detect the location of Celestials, Fiends, or Undead within 60 feet. So a nice little utility to have uh, in some specific situations. Uh, and then we also get Lay on Hands, which you know gives us a pool of points that we can use to sort of heal uh, or cure disease or poison. Um, you get five times your pally level in points for Lay on Hands. Uh, between this and Second Wind, actually, we've got a couple of nice little healing options to use in a pinch, uh, especially if we're needing to heal ourselves. Uh, it's too bad that we can't heal Exhaustion. That would be awesome if we could use this. Like, maybe for 10 points, heal Exhaustion? Come on, that's... Well, that, that would probably be overpowered. But anyway, that would be nice. Um, at level 11, 
we are a paladin too and we get to pick a fighting style uh, assuming that you took great weapon master uh, fighting style with the fighter i'd probably go for either defense um, for a plus one to our armor class or a superior technique for your favorite battle master maneuver but then we do get some spells for paladins as well here i would you know you can't concentrate or on spells or cast spells as a raging barbarian while you're raging anyway Right, so you probably want to take stuff that's useful out of combat. Um, hard to go wrong with like cure wounds for a nice little extra healing. Probably you know detect magic. Uh, that that's definitely a nice utility to have when you need it. But we, of course, as a paladin too, will also be getting divine smite, and that's the main reason that we're here, of course. So when you hit a creature with a melee attack, a melee weapon attack, I should say. Um, you can expend a spell slot to deal an extra 2d8 of radiant damage, and it, that goes up by 1d8 for every spell slot higher than first that you that you spend, right? There's no reason why, barring a mean DM, uh, that you couldn't wait to see if you crit and then decide that you would also like to smite. That's how, it's, how it works at 99% of tables, um, and rules is written for that matter, as far as I can tell. I've heard rumors of some DMs not allowing that because they think it's too cheesy. But anyway, so at this point, when you crit, you're adding an extra 2d10 for your half-orc savage attacks and your piercer feet, and then an extra 2d8, which if you only do it when you smite, that damage doubles for 4d8. Um, that's amazing. That's a lot of extra damage on a critical hit. At level 12, um, here's where the build takes a little turn that's probably unexpected for, for most of you, I would think. Um, it turns out there was a reason that our Berserker was so drawn to this deity that they were drawn to. Um, one of their ancestors, it turns out, was an angel of this deity. They were transformed into a mortal, and they were sent to fight in our god's name and, and happened to birth a child while they were here. <laughs> so. You have a divine spark of magic in you, it turns out, and you have been marked by this deity to be a vessel of their divine magic and accomplish some great task that they have for you to accomplish. So we're going to take some sorcerer levels here. The, the biggest problem, I think, that we have at this point is that we don't have enough spell slots to keep up with all of the critical hits that you're going to be making and, and therefore smiting every time you get a critical hit, right? To solve that problem, we could continue putting levels in Paladin, but their spell slot progression is just a little slow for my taste as a, as a sort of half caster, half martial type character, right? They're, they get fewer spell slots, you know, per level, essentially, they progress more slowly. So I think the best route to go to solve that problem is to go Divine Soul sorcerer um, for a few reasons a I really like the story uh, B sorcerers can give us the most spell slots per level that we can use for smites of all of the charisma based spell casters I think definitely there's an argument to go warlock here instead um, warlock could be really nice and their spell slots refresh on a short rest but after a few levels, you don't have nearly as many of them. You know, you only get two forever with a Warlock. You could even potentially go Bard. I just, of all of those options, um, I like Sorcerer best. I think Divine Soul Sorcerer especially just really works thematically. Um, they'll help us sort of continue on this path that we've started of, of having some nice kind of support and utility outside of combat. If you'd rather go something else or even continue Paladin here, that's totally fine. It wouldn't make a huge difference. But for us, we're going Sorcerer. And at level one, we get to choose our, you know, our uh, Sorceress Origin, our subclass. Like I've said, we're going Divine Soul. And uh, as a Divine Soul Sorcerer, we get access to both the Sorcerer and the Cleric spell lists, which is frankly fantastic. We get a favored by the gods feature, which tells us that once per short rest, if we miss an attack or fail with a saving throw, we can add 2d4 to the roll, potentially changing the outcome, right? That's really nice to have in a pinch. I would probably save this for like a really important saving throw. 
unless you just really need an enemy to die as soon as possible and you miss them with it with an attack that might otherwise have finished them off or something like that of course we also get spells as a sorcerer level one and you know i'm not going to really recommend or talk about any of them um i, I love how like our pious champion berserker can now suddenly become a pretty well-rounded character between the paladin levels and the and the sorcerer uh, divine soul sorcerer levels you know out of combat with these additional spells and features and things that we're getting you know so we get some cantrips now some first level spells pick your favorite or you know the most fun or most useful that you think uh, you would want to use outside of combat um, there's some great choices, you know, Guidance, Minor Illusion, Prestidigitation, Mending, Message, um, Featherfall, Comprehend Languages, uh, pick your favorite. All right, at level 13, we are a Sorcerer 2, and we get Font of Magic, so we get our Sorcery Points, right? Um, we use these Sorcery Points to fuel our meta magic options that we get at Sorcerer 3, but for now, we can just use them to create additional spell slots. Um, which, honestly, for us, is primarily what we want them for anyway. <laughs> so now at this level, um, we have, because we've multiclassed, you know, with a couple levels of Paladin, uh, we have the spell slots of a third level caster, essentially, right? Four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots, plus a couple of sorcery points that we could convert into one more first level spell slot. So five first level spell slots total, plus two second level spell slots. Let's do a damage report. Um, since we checked in last time, in addition to some utility and support features that we've picked up, uh, we've got Divine Smite now, and a good number of spell slots with which to be smiting. Again, in case I hadn't mentioned this already, for those who don't know, even though you can't cast or concentrate on spells while you're raging, you absolutely can use spell slots for Divine Smite, right? That's not casting a spell. Um, so. Here's the question, can we count Divine Smite as part of our sustainable damage? Again, if we're just looking at damage over a single combat encounter, and if we only smite when we crit, yes, we can. You absolutely might not want to do that, right? Saving your spells for other things like healing, and utility, and that's fine. But if a combat encounter, if a typical combat encounter lasts four to six, rounds um, and we're critting on roughly half of those which we should be i think it's safe to assume that we will have the spell slot for a smite on every crit here over you know an entire combat encounter likely with some left over obviously lower your expectations for you know your damage outside of your frenzy round and when and or when you're out of uh, spell slots to to be smiting uh, but during that one glorious encounter right um, we're attacking three times per turn for 1d10 plus 4 strength plus 2 rage plus 10 from Great Weapon Master, critting 19% of the time, adding 2d10 and 4d8 when we do, because we're smiting, right? Uh, I'm just assuming that we're using a first level spell slot for smite. We only have two second level spell slots. That's definitely not sustainable, and you might want to use those second level spell slots for something else. I don't know. Anyway. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing on average 85 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 66 damage per round. So we've pulled back a little bit more towards the middle of the pack uh, at this level when compared to other sustained DPR builds, but we've picked up a lot of great, you know, nice utility and support features. When, when you do catch that juicy critical hit fish, uh, you'll be critting, you'll be hitting for about 51 damage on average on, on a single attack, right? And you get multiple attacks per turn. And, and you should be doing that roughly once every other turn. So that's fun. Okay, if we're still playing this character beyond level 13, um, I think we have a little bit of a fork in the road here. On the one hand, you could go back to Barbarian. Um, you've picked up some nice additional damage on critical hit, and, and you want to get back to you know those great survivability features that you'd get from Berserker Barbarian from this point out, um, including a d12 of hit points every level compared to the d6 sorcerer, right? That's actually a pretty big deal. You would eventually get immunity to being feared and charmed while you're raging. That's um, potentially a, a, a massive 
benefit depending on your table and, and the adventure you're playing you'd get um, an advantage on initiative and basically immunity to being surprised um, you'd get more rages you'd get more rage damage and eventually um, brutal critical which would let us add yet another d10 when we crit that's a pretty nice suite of features and honestly if i were playing this character in game i'm pretty sure that's the direction i'd end up going but on the other hand this character so far has been built to do as much damage as possible. We've been throwing caution to the wind so far. Um, I don't really know why we have to stop now. The truth is, we would get just a little bit more damage out of our crits by sticking with Sorcerer here. Thanks to the higher level spell slots that would let us smite a lot harder, right? Not to mention um, some additional utility and support features that those higher level spells could potentially provide. In addition, there is one thing that happens to this character at level 20 if we stick with Sorcerer the rest of the way. And even though I don't really talk about level 20 that much in my builds, it was just, it was too appealing to pass up. So you do what you want, for us, we're gonna stick with the Sorcerer path. At level 14, we are a Sorcerer 3 then. So we get second level spells. Um, I would probably focus mostly on uh, like support and utility type spells here, of course. Uh, aid would definitely be a go-to. It lets you raise um, a player's maximum hit points uh, and total hit points by five. It doesn't require concentration, lasts eight hours. And so it's definitely something that you could sort of cast at the beginning of a combat day, right? Um, and enjoy a little buff, again, keeping in mind how important hit points are for you. And of course, helping your friends, uh, in addition, is, 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 is a nice little benefit that your party will appreciate. Um, do keep in mind that this is raising your maximum hit points, it's not giving you temporary hit points, so you could potentially have both if you had a reliable source of temporary hit points. Lesser Restoration is a great go-to, it can cure blind, deaf, paralyzed, poison. Prayer of Healing is another great sort of very efficient group heal. It costs, or it takes 10 minutes to cast, um, so you definitely would just be using it out of combat. Most clerics and divine soul sorcerers even, I think, would probably want to take spiritual weapon at this level. Uh, you'd think it would be a good sort of go-to for the non-frenzied combat encounters because it doesn't require concentration, but uh, the attack it makes would be based on our charisma, uh, which is garbage, so I would probably pass, personally. As a Sorcerer level 3, we also get metamagic. My plan is to convert most of my sorcery points into additional spell slots for more smites, and so you know we use these sorcery points for these metamagic things that improve our spells, right? Typically, most sorcerers. Um, again, I think I would be converting most of them into spell slots, but you know, one that I could see getting some mileage out of would be like twin spell. If you wanted to, for example, uh, twin cure wounds um, and cast it on two players for you know a couple of sorcery points, that could be nice and, and make a, a not super efficient heal a lot more efficient. I'd love to know what uh, what you guys would use for for other meta magic options. Let me know in the comments. At level 15, we are a Sorcerer 4, we get an ab and we get another ability score increase or feat. Finally, finally, we get to cap our strength. Uh, so we'd bump our strength here, cap it at 20, and I mean, I can't believe it took us to level 15 to cap our strength. Uh, the thing that bothers me the most about this build, actually, is, is this, that it took us that long. Obviously, you could multi-class less to get here sooner, um, or even take a strength bump instead of great weapon master for that matter. But it, but that would actually be worse for your damage outside of you know very high enemy armor class. But anyway, yeah, happy to finally get our strength up. All right, at level sixteen, you are a sorcerer five, and that means you get third level sorcery spells or cleric spells. There are a lot of good support out of combat spells here. Uh, I have two favorites. Catnap is fantastic. Let your party take a short rest in just 10 minutes once per day, um, which everyone will love you for, uh, especially if you're in like a dungeon crawl or something. Um, and motivational speech is awesome if no one else in your party is giving uh, temporary hit points anyway. Uh, it's a nice way to give everyone a five, you know, five temporary hit points and advantage on wisdom saving throws for an hour. Plus, if they're hit by an attack, they have advantage on their next attack. Um, now, once the temporary hit points are gone, uh, the other benefits go away as well. But 
you know, assuming we're using this and aid on ourselves, that's, you know, an extra 10 hit points for us. We, we get a lot of mileage out of those 10 extra hit points. And I mean, the fact that we get to give them to the rest of our party as well is, is great. Also, of course, if no one else in your party can resurrect, Revivify is available at this level. At level 17, we are a Sorcerer 6, and we get uh, the Divine Soul feature Empowered Healing. Um, it's just a little bump to healing that you or an ally receive if they're within five feet of you. Um, when you roll the dice to heal, you can spend a sorcery point to re-roll any number of them once per turn. Uh, it's kind of like the great weapon fighting style, but for healing in a way. Uh, anyway, final damage report at level 17. So we have spell slots as though we were a seventh level full caster, thanks to six of sorcery and two sorcerer and two of paladin. So that means we have one fourth level spell slot, three third level spell slots, uh, three second level spell slots, and four first level spell slots. Just sort of in the interest of exploring what's possible here, let's assume that you're, you are using a, you know, a third level spell slot uh, on average any time that you crit in a fight, right? Sometimes it might be a fourth, sometimes it might be a second. You could create more with sorcery points, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll assume that 4d8 uh, for a third level smite, right? Which, of course, you would double on a critical hit for 8d8. So every time we get a critical hit, I'm going to assume that extra 8d8 of damage. Otherwise, you know, not a lot has changed for the character since our last damage report at 13, other than our strength bumped, uh, got bumped up by one and our proficiency bonus got bumped up by one. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing, on average, 103 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class, we would be doing 83 damage per round on average. Um, all right, we broke the centennial barrier, uh, just barely, but we broke it, which I'm happy about. And so, you know, at this level compared to other to other builds, we're still we're still in tier one. We're kind of the lower half of of tier one of my other sustained damage builds. So, it's it's pretty strong, right? Um, now. At level 20, as most of you know, I don't usually go that far in my builds because so few of us actually play the game at that level. But I couldn't resist talking about it with this character because if you stick with Sorcerer all the way to 20, you will be a Sorcerer 9, which means you get fifth level spell slots. And since we are a Divine Soul Sorcerer, that means we have access to Greater Restoration. And since you have the spell slots of a 10th level caster, we actually have two 5th level spell slots at level 20. And, I mean, you could even create more with sorcery points, I guess, if you needed to, which means that you no longer have to beg your allies to relieve you of your exhaustion when you frenzy. Um, as long as you have the gold to buy the material components and you're a level 20 character, so I can't imagine that you wouldn't, now you can just wipe away your fatigue all by yourself, or I guess with the help of your deity, um, two or even three times a day. And I just love this so much. It just makes me want to play like a level 20 one-shot campaign with this character so badly, because now you can just be frenzied all the time. All right, time for final thoughts. So um, the, the tier score for this character... Uh, to decide kind of where they fit when compared to other builds overall, tier one, tier two, they got a 60. That puts them firmly into tier one. And I am surprised, to be honest with you, that they did that well for sustained DPR. Now, I know there are asterisks all over the place with this one. And you don't have to tell me. You're probably going to anyway. And that's okay. I still love you. This is kind of, I think, the first time that I've really almost intentionally created what feels to me like a Nova sustained damage hybrid build, right? Um, where instead of like picking one turn for big massive damage, you pick one combat round for really nice sustained damage. The Cheese Grater from last week uh, did that a little bit, a couple of others that I've done in the past, but arguably those were a little more sustainable than even this one, usually getting like a couple combat encounters <laughs> per day uh, for that level of damage. I might have to create like a separate spreadsheet if I keep doing this um, for these like 
this character can do this level of damage, but only one or two combat encounters per day, you know, type thing to kind of keep them separate from the truly sustained, you know, damage builds or whatever. At the end of the day, I really, I really enjoyed this this character. We we do pretty pretty good, you know, sustained reliable damage per round, um, with some nice utility and support features, uh, at least by kind of mid to late game. Um, but then when you really need to pull out the big guns for like the super important fight for the big boss fight right you can do so and and hit as hard as just about any sustained damage per round character that i've that i've ever built some people might find a build like this to be a little boring um, a little vanilla uh, and i can see that um, at the end of the day you know in combat you're pretty much just hitting stuff right not me I mean, for those who have like played craps with a bunch of friends, right, and you're all standing around the table and everyone's yelling and screaming when the shooter, you know, hits the number that you all want, that's not boring. That's a lot of fun, and, and that is what this build feels like to me. I mean, sure, everyone crits once in a while, but you are critting all the time. And when you do, it's like a freight train rolling through your enemies. So I hope that you will laugh and shout and pound the table every time you do because it's going to be happening a lot. So that's the build for the week. I love you guys so much. Thank you for watching. Um, please do check out the other uh, content on the channel. You know, our live play games, um, the sliding into my DMs kind of talk show thing, D&D University for those who are wanting to learn the, the basics of the game. I hope you'll check it out. Um, but I really appreciate you. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a fantastic day and we will see you very soon.